Um, I am pleased to announce uh, uh, that uh, we are happy to have you with us. We welcome you to this session on seed saving uh, Zoom meeting, and we hope you get what you like out of it and more. If you have any questions, the chat box is available. We'll do our best to answer questions as the uh, session progresses, but we'll also answer questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, stay muted, stay out of video for the reasons given up front. And uh, my name is James Theory, and together with Rolly George, we are both small farm educators and we've been making presentations together today Rory will be doing it alone and I start the recording now and Rory it's all yours all right thank you James I appreciate it um, so today we're going to be talking about seed saving um, when I first decided I was going to do this webinar um, I was since we, James and I are both uh, small farms educators. We we focus a lot on local foods, and so this originally was going to be developed for vegetable production. But since uh, registrations have been coming in, I'd say about half of you that have registered asked for more information on native plants as well for seed saving. So um, the information that I'm being that is being presented today throughout this webinar will have the terms and the, and the uh, uh, information that you need, whether you're doing vegetables, whether you're doing flowers, or whether you're doing native plants. So the terms and all the things that we're gonna be talking about affects all of that. But just at the end of the presentation, I am going to have a specific section just for native wildflowers, native plants. So uh, hang in there and we'll get to it. But so today we're going to talk about seed saving. We're going to figure out what's going on and how, how it's going to be done because it's getting to that point of the year where everybody is starting to save their seeds. The gardens are finishing up, the flowers are flowering, and, and the seeds are being developed. So let's go ahead and get started on that. And let me just do something here real quick. All right. So what we have is uh, all right so basically what we're looking for is why do we want to go ahead and do seed saving um, and what we're looking at is the terminology for today we'll talk about pollinators pollinizers and fertilization and the difference between those plant life cycles so a lot of this is going to be uh, repetition of what you've heard before, maybe just a reminder, but all of these factor into seed production. Uh, we'll talk about cross-pollination, self-pollination, heirloom and hybrids, and what the differences between those are and how you can keep some of those pure or not pure, whether you want cross-pollination or not. Harvesting, cleaning, storage labeling, dormancy, germination, and then wildflowers. So as we get started, first we need to figure out what is a seed? Well, a seed consists of the embryo, which is in a suspended state of development, and a food source, or the cotyledons, or the endosperm, whichever term you want to use. And it's generally, it's going to be an enclosed in a protective covering called the seed coat. The seed holds everything that that little embryo will need in order to germinate. So the picture on the right shows the little bean plant. You can see the embryo itself. The plumule is going to be the, uh, the leaves as they start coming out. The radical is going to be the root development as it starts to germinate. The cotyledon, that whole peanut seed, that whole source there, that's called the cotyledon, and that will be the food source for that embryo as it starts to germinate. So you want to be able to save seeds uh, why do you want to do it? You want to be able to save them so that you are uh, spend less money on the seeds themselves. Save traditional or heritage varieties, maybe to have your own choice of varieties, such as flavor or disease resistance, maybe to breed new varieties. Some people do that just so new varieties can be developed. 
course, you want to be able to share and swap with your friends on um, some of the seeds that you're growing. And then you also want to select for local qualities, such as high yielding or compactness. That's a really big one in there. And generally, you want to have seed for next year's planting. Uh, commercial growers generally look for shipping quality and the ability to be stored for long periods of time. So what they're looking for may be a little bit different than what you're looking for. So flower parts. It's going to be important to know the difference between the flowers. So flowers exist to produce the seeds and the seed is, is a uh, ripened ovule that turns into the embryo, right? Most plants carry both male and female productive organs often within the same flower. The male are the stamen, which consists of the anther and the filaments, and the female is the pistil, which con consists of the stigma, the style, the ovary, and the ovules. Plant pollination occurs when the transfer of the male pollen grain reaches the stigma of the flower. It's stimulated to germinate. Pollen tube grows down into the ovary area where the pollen cell fertilizes the egg cell, and a second fertilization occurs in there that develops into the uh, endosperm or the food source for the embryo as it germinates. So there's diff two different types of flowers. This is gonna be important when you decide what type of plant you're gonna be working with. The first one is a complete flower. A complete flower is also called a perfect flower. These flowers have all the floral parts. It has the petals, it has the sepals, it has the stamens and the pistil. So it has both the male and female reproductive parts in one flower itself. That's a complete flower. An incomplete flower is going to be one where one or more of the floral parts is absent. It's either going to have the pistils or the stamen, but not both. So it's either a male flower or a female flower. Uh, and we'll talk about where these can be located um, on the plants that you're working with. So knowing which type of flower you have on a plant will determine how the seeds will be developed. A little bit more uh, terminology that we're gonna talk about is called monoecious and dioecious. And the big difference between these is that when you think about these, think monoecious is mo meaning one, and dioecious with di meaning two. So let's talk about monoecious first. Monoecious plants are generally considered having one house. There are separate male and female flowers on one plant. So the plant will have imperfect flowers to begin with. These types of plants can bloom and set seed all on their own, just like the corn plant. So you're gonna have those uh, tassels at the top that are gonna drop down by wind into those uh, flower areas for the corn production. Now with these type of plants, you generally need to have a pollinator, whether it's going to be wind or insect or bees or something in order to move that pollen down into where it needs to go. Generally cross-pollination uh, requires cross-pollination for the monoecious plants and you're going to have these, see these a lot with the corn and pumpkins, squash, cucumbers, these types of plants. And that's a really good example there from uh, University of Maryland Extension showing the difference between a male and a female flower. You can see the female flower has that uh, fruit at the end of it. So again, they're gonna have the, the miniature fruit below the petals of the flowers. Cucurbit plants can have male and females. If you ever notice in your garden this year, if you are noticing that your cucumbers tend to be a little bit curved, it's because of poor pollination. So somehow you need to get more pollinators into there. A dioecious plant, di meaning two, so that means that these plants have only one sex of flower per plant. So generally when you have these plants, you're going to need a plant of the opposite sex for pollination. You see this a lot with asparagus and spinach and some hybrid cucumbers. You need to have a male plant and a female plant. You also see this a lot, and if you've ever uh, gone to the nursery or tried to buy holly plants, They'll say, well, if you want the red berries, you need to buy two. And then you're thinking, okay, well, <clears throat> do I really need the two plants? Yes, you do. You need a male plant and a female plant. So they, there are tables out in the internet to help you to determine what type of pollinators you need or pollinizers you need in order to uh, get those red berries that you're looking for on the holly plants. But dioecious is two houses, two separate plants. 
<clears throat> when we talk about the pollinators, these are going to be the, uh, the insects, the wind, uh, what is going to be coming in to help pollinate those flowers. So these are the things that do the work, right? Pollinators. So they'll come in, they are attracted to the flowers, they will have, uh, they'll collect the pollen on them or they'll go from one flower to the next and do those pollinations themselves. So those are gonna be the pollinators. What drives them to the flowers? Well, when you think about insect eyes, they come in two forms, simple and compound. So simple eyes do uh, very little more than just differentiate between light and dark, but the compound eye, which is the classic eye that everybody imagines, is a different matter. These flower petals are decorated with intricate patterns highlighting their reproductive areas and the sources of nectar for the visiting insects. So they're kind of like a runway to show the plant, show the uh, pollinator exactly where that pollen and that reward is at if they come in and, and, and steal a little bit. They're also stealing the pollen and going from another plant. So these patterns really make a difference on some of those flowers. The pollinizers, these are the ones that have the pollen that you need in order to get those red berries or whatever on the plants that you're looking for. These are also the ones, these are also the plants or the flowers that tend to have that yellow dust every spring. On the back of my deck, I always get the yellow dust that covers it, all this pollen dust that's released. And so the pollinizers are the ones that are going to be a plant that's going to provide your pollen. So the biggest thing with this is that the plant must provide abundant, compatible, and viable pollen at the same time as the pollinated plant. So you have a female plant and a male plant. If the female plant opens the flowers before the male plant has pollen ready, then they will not be pollinated. And so it's that cross. They both have to be available at the same time. They all both have to nick at the same time. They have to be available in order for it to work. And that's why with, with hollies or other plants, uh, they require the male and female plants. They all flower at the same time. If you work uh, in uh, horticulture, if you notice that you've tried to grow some apples, some apples produce very little pollen or pollen that's sterile. So when you buy apples at the store, you need to be able to make sure that you are buying an apple that is either can self-fertilize itself or you have another apple variety that will be able to do the, the pollination as well. And so you may need to buy more than just one variety. The other thing you can do with apples, and a lot of uh, some of the commercial growers do this, is they incorporate crab apples in there. So they get that pollen uh, generated from the crab apples and it goes over to the apples. And then that's how you get the apples. So remember that even though you're changing the pollen or the pollen's going from one to another, like a crab apple to an apple tree, it's the seeds that are being developed for next year that may show a difference. And we'll talk about that. But what we're talking about now is just why you need to have more than one plant or uh, in order for pollination to occur. Some of the life cycles that we have, again, this is gonna be a quick review. First one is gonna be the annual. So everybody knows hopefully that an annual only requires one growing season to produce a seed and complete its life cycle. So it, it's seeded, it grows, uh, produces the seeds for next year and then it dies off. Generally, these do not survive the winters. Next ones are going to be the perennials. These can live for three years or more. There are herbaceous perennials, such as your hostas, where all the plant is there in the summertime. They'll die back in the wintertime, and you don't see anything above the soil line with these plants. They all just kind of die off. The plant material dies, and it, you don't see anything. But you also have what they call woody perennials. And so these woody perennials are the, the ones where you see the wood that is up above the soil line. So they stay above the soil level at the end of the growing season. And they can either have with or without leaves. And then there's biennials. The biennials require two growing seasons to produce their seeds, okay? Season one, you're gonna have the vegetable, uh, the vegetative growth that's gonna occur with that. 
And then what's going to happen is they'll grow and they will uh, go through a winter dormancy. So they're not going to really do anything the first year. They won't produce the seeds the first year. They'll go through a dormancy. And then the second season, what happens is that they will go ahead and uh, continue growing from the point that they stopped and they went into their dormancy. They'll continue growing. They will produce a flower stem and the flowers themselves. So it's that second year that's going to get them to do this. Now, why are biennials a little bit different? Because biennial plants require that exposure to cold. It requires that vernalization. That's the term, vernalization. So sometimes the temperature is below 50 degrees for eight to 12 weeks is required. The hormones in the plant are going to change during that time each crop will have its own vernalization time. So once the second season starts and that cold temperature has been met, the requirement has been met, then what's going to happen is they will continue to grow and produce their seeds. Um, so they must be able to survive the winter with these biennials. Some of the biennial vegetables that you may have in your garden or that you're thinking of growing out uh, you need to have that cold period in order to get those seeds, things like carrots, onions, turnips, parsley. These types of biennials, we require that vernalization period. Some of the biennial flowers that require that, such as hollyhock, sweet william, evening primrose, lupins, these all require that vernalization temperature change. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about cross-pollination and self-pollination, heirloom, and hybrids. And I think this is the one that, that I had the most questions on to begin with. So cross-pollination plants or plants that are cross-pollinated generally do not breed true. Other terms for it are open pollination, cross-breeding, interbreeding, whatever. These do not breed true at all. But it occurs when the pollen of one flower is transferred to a flower on a different plant. So the resulting seeds will have a genetic variability when they're planted. So they're not going to come out as the parents are. So things like brassicas, the cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, these all can cross with each other with varying results for the next generation, generally none of them looking like the parent plants. Cultivated carrots can cross with wild type carrots, so the Queen Anne's lace, resulting in early bolting or flowering of the future generations in the first year and may develop pale, tough, and small roots. Some of the advantages of being able to cross pollinate is that it can facilitate the plant's ability to adapt to changing environments. That's going to be a big one. It needs to be able to adapt in order to be able to survive. And this is how we tend to get new varieties of plants in the marketplace. Cross-pollination are generally divided into two subgroups. There are pollination by airborne pollen, and there's also pollination by insect-borne pollen. So many plants depend on the insect-borne pollen or insect pollination. The plant gives the insect a reward for visiting the flowers by producing nectar and a conspicuous floral display like we talked about earlier. Some plants produce pollen that is so fine-grained that it's transported by wind. And these plants do not produce these uh, conspicuous flowers and they don't produce the nectar. So they're generally just wind-borne. So how do you prevent cross-pollination? Well, there's several ways to be able to do this, especially if you want to just keep a, a specific trait or you're looking for this plant to come back true the next time. So preventing cross-pollination, you can grow the same variety plant at the same time, but you can also cover the flowers or bag them with paper bags. So uh, this is, the bagging is generally done after pollination occurs. So with this corn, what they're doing is they're taking the tassel uh, pollen and they're going ahead and uh, dusting it, hand uh, pollinating the flowers, and then they're bagging them. And that bag is to help prevent any type of cross-contamination that's going to occur. Second way is being able to develop cages or nets 
for whole trees or bushes. Now this can be really expensive and the picture that you see there is from a commercial production facility, but you can do it at home. You can develop these, uh, such as maybe some tunnels or covering the flowers and vegetables once it's pollinated. So you don't get that cross pollination that's going to occur. This can work well for varieties of the same species where they will be protected from outside pollinators. For wind pollinated plants grown for seed, uh, these barriers generally will not work. Another thing that you can do is to grow vegetables at different times. Generally, uh, these work for plants that have a short growing season where two or three plantings can occur in one season or staggering the plantings throughout the season. Plant seeds today, two weeks later, you're gonna plant a second row, two weeks later, you'll plant a third row. Uh, so that's gonna help stagger those. So when it flowers, the first row starts flowering, the second row is not ready to flower. And so you can keep those seeds as they are. Or you can just plant one variety per growing season. You can also grow vegetables or flowers of the same variety, but grow them some distance apart. So cross pollination will not occur. And in order to do this, the use of windbreaks is going to be important to prevent that pollen transfer. It's not gonna cover 100%, but there's a way of being able to do that. So now your next question to me is going to be, well, what are going to be those distances? What do you mean by those distances? So wind pollinated plants require more room on an open area than they would need in a forest area or a city where those trees in the buildings tend to help block those, those seeds. So pure seeds can be saved from cross pollination by isolating that single variety. The distance has gotta be long enough or large enough to present, prevent the contamination from those. And this distance variety is going to vary from species to species. So with home gardeners, you're gonna to have to consider the level of purity that you're looking for, the size of the plantings that you're going to have, whether you've had problems in the past with similar crops or how the pollination is affected. Is it wind blown? Is it insect blown? So um, some general thoughts on this, the more plants of two different varieties grown at the same time, the larger the isolation distance is required. Having higher flower diversity within a garden can help distract the pollinator and the likelihood that the insect would fly from the flower of one variety to the flower of another variety of the same vegetable is gonna decrease. So the more flowers, the more options they have for them and the less chance of uh, cross-contamination or cross-pollination is going to occur. So, so there are some resources out there and I just put one in there. I, this is a book uh, from Suzanne Ashworth. It's called Seed to Seed. And she talks about seed isolation distances. And the table I'm gonna show here next is the uh, isolation distance table, depending on the type of plant. And this isn't a full table. This is just a copy of, of one that was out there. As far as isolation dis distances that Susan has, as opposed to what the USDA has. And you notice that the two are going to be a little bit different. So broccoli, the isolation distance for Susan was one mile, and for USDA is 660 feet. So you have to understand that, that Susan Ashworth was looking at basically the homeowners or the small farm growers. USDA is generally working with commercial growers. So the isolation distances are gonna be less. They know that these big commercial growers are gonna be focusing on a specific thing. So they don't need as large of an isolation distance as what Susan was mentioning for, for homeowners or for smaller areas. And the table also says whether it's a wind or insect or self-pollinating. Uh, <clears throat> self so there are resources out there. So let's talk about self-pollination. These are the plants that are gonna be breeding true, okay? Self-pollination generally takes place when the pollen of one flower pollinates the same flower or other flowers of the same individual plant. 
this is a really good way for excluding pollen from other flowers. So as an example are pea flowers. So the petals of the flower for the pea are typically closed during the period of time that the stigma is receptive to the pollen. And the pollen that is going to be uh, focusing or landing on that uh, style, the stigma there, is from its own flowers, so its own anthers. And it's going to be exclusive just for its own pollination. So when the pea flower generally opens, it has already been fertilized by itself. So it's self-pollination on that. So generally requires an external movement or wind or to release the pollen onto the stigma. So even though the flowers are closed, that movement of the wind is going to jostle that pollen so that it's going to do a self-pollination within that flower. If you have flowers or grow plants in a greenhouse environment or someplace where you're not going to have uh, pollinators available, you can either bring them in or you can do a handshake of the plant. So cucumbers and tomatoes, you can go ahead and shake those plants. That pollen will fall and do some sort of pollination on that. It's not going to be 100% correct or perfect, uh, but if you don't have access to pollinators, that is something that you can do as well. Some of the advantages of self-pollination, uh, the offspring are going to be very similar to the parents. That's good. It'll spend less energy in production of pollinator attractants, so it's not going to have that nectar and it's not going to have those flowery uh, petals on the flowers themselves. It can grow in areas where pollinators are absent or they're scarce. There's less chance of failure of pollination and therefore it helps to maintain the purity of the race. And it ensures the offspring will remain adapted to its own environment. That seems good, but there are some disadvantages that are associated with this as well. New species are produced. So you're getting the same plant over and over. And nothing's going to be changing on that. Self-pollination does not help in the evolution process as well. The resistant to diseases can become less because you're kind of doing an inbreeding on this. And so the progeny or the, the future generations may show less vigor due to the self-pollination. So saving seeds from one or two plants may promote inbreeding. So when collecting your seeds, choose several plants of the same variety. Characteristics that are undesirable are generally not going to be eliminated with uh, self-pollination. Some of the uh, fruit trees, flowers, and vegetables that are self-pollinated, this is not a complete list, but it gives you some ideas as to, you know, what you're looking at. Uh, generally, they can self-pollinate, but some selfers or self-pollinating plants will often be cross-pollinated by insects. So again, you need to kind of be careful if you want to maintain that race of plants that you're looking at. Just remember that nature does have ways. Plants adapt. Okay, so when a plant is taken from the original habitat, it can turn from a cross-pollinated plant into a predominantly self-pollinating plant because the pollinator insect is not available. And so there's always ways that nature gets around things. So I can say one thing today and say, this is the way it, that it generally is. And then two years down the line, something may change in the environment. Something may, you know, you may not have those bees where you generally have them anymore. You may not have those hummingbirds coming back anymore or the butterflies. And so that can really change. And so nature really has a way of changing things. So nothing is set in stone with a lot of things. Let's talk a little bit about heirloom plants. So heirloom plants are going to have a, a history of being passed down from generation to generation. So the uh, plants, maybe the corn or the tomato plants that your grandmother used to plant, she may have saved some seeds and it's passed down from generation to generation and now you have the seeds, right? So now you wanna be able to continue to keep those heirloom seeds uh, the way that your grandmother had them. Heirlooms must be open pollinated, but again, not all po open pollinated plants are heirlooms. So seeds can remain true through the protection from unwanted cross pollination. And so we talked a little bit about that as well. 
uh, and to keep them the heirloom traits, you don't plant other cultivars that could cross pollinate nearby. So in order to maintain pure seed of a variety, pollen from that variety must reach the stigma of the plant, keeping the pollen from competing varieties away. If pollen from a different variety within that species comes in contact with the plant's stigma, resulting in fertilization, then the fruit seeds will be crossed and will not come true to type. So heirlooms, uh, again, you're gonna have to take a look and, and determine what other varieties or what other species you're gonna plant around them. Make sure that that cross-pollination cannot occur. When I'm talking about heirlooms, some of the things that you may have seen in the catalogs or the seed catalogs may be such as the early bush Italian beans or the brandywine tomatoes, purple globe radishes, and the bantam corn. These are all good examples of heirlooms and all of these are available in any seed catalog, uh, <clears throat> such as the uh, American Seed or Burpee, Seed Savers, all these companies have heirloom varieties that you can buy from, knowing that the seeds that you're gonna buy are going to be these heirloom varieties when you grow them out. Okay, let's talk a little bit about hybrids. Hybrids are a little bit different. So a hybrid is generally developed or con uh, developed. It's a controlled method of pollination in which the pollen of two related parent plants is crossed by human intervention. And that's the key, human intervention. So there's a reason why you're taking these two flowers and wanting to cross them. There's something that's going to develop that's going to be unique about that. So the, the offspring of this cross is going to be genetically different from their parents. And the resulting generation or the resulting seeds that are produced from this cross is gonna be called F1 generation or the first uh, filial generation. Now, what does that mean? All right, so let's take a little bit of beginning genetics here. So we have a purple flowered plant and a white flowered plant that we want to cross, right? And so when we cross them and we get the seeds and we harvest the seeds and then the next year we plant them out, what happens is that those seeds are going to generate your first generation or the F1 generation. Now with genetics, there are more than just what happens with uh, the plants themselves, but the purple is gonna be a dominant color over the white. And so because it's dominant, the first generation is all going to show purple because that's just the way the first generation splits out because it's a dominant color. And it's the F1 generation that when you're looking at the seed catalogs in the book, and they say F1 hybrid, these seeds that, uh, that are in this packet are the first generation. These have specific traits that uh, people will be looking for, okay? Whether they're large succulent fruits and excellent disease resistance. And so these, these are gonna be a little bit different. But what happens if we take this first generation or the seeds from here and we plant them out we collect the seeds for the next year. So there's our parent generation, purple and white. The first generation, they're all purple, but we take those seeds from that purple F1 generation and plant them out. They're going to be different in the second generation. You're gonna have three, uh, three to one ratio of the purple and the white. And why? It's because that white color is starting to come uh, back into uh, production. It's not gonna stay hidden. It is the dominant purple is starting to be reduced a little bit. And so even in the second generation, you're gonna see a lot of variety associated with that. So these hybrids can really uh, uh, have some differences or changes within the seeds that you're trying to save. So in a hybrid crossing, this can occur naturally, but FC, F1 seeds are deliberately crossed, as I mentioned before, because there's a desired trait. The F1s tend to grow better, and they tend to produce higher yields than the parent varieties. And this is a term called hybrid vigor. And a lot of growers, a lot of uh, commercial 
growers that that grow for these seeds know what they're going to be selling and so they generally ask for a higher price so these f1 seeds that you see at the store and the catalogs can be a little bit higher than just the regular seeds themselves so as an example a big boy hybrid you save the seeds, you'll find that the next season's fruit will be very few plants that closely resemble the big boy. You may have the big fruits and the flavor, but you may have some that have little fruits or maybe have uh, not as much flavor, or the seeds may be infertile. So overall, when you're talking about saving seeds, you really don't want to do a hybrid cross unless you're looking for some new varieties in order to try and, and play with it or, or see what happens. Harvesting and cleaning. So this is the one uh, where you're going to start talking about uh, seed maturity. Seed maturity varies and it's going to be based on the species and the environmental conditions that these plants are grown in. Generally, most seeds are ready to harvest when the seeds become brown, uh, may become shiny and or they may easily fall out of their capsule or their flower head. Seeds will glow, uh, slowly expand as the embryo grows. Uh, you may have noticed this if you have ever grown beans or peas. Uh, this is because the high water content within the seed or the, uh, the, the seed itself. But there comes a point where the fruit, such as the bean pod or the shell or the husk that surrounds it is fully grown, but it's still green, showing that it's not ripe. Uh, for example, if you open a bean pod and if the seeds are still attached to the pod when you open it or they have a whitish color or they have, still have a lot of moisture associated with it, then they're not really ready to harvest. It may take another few days or another week after that point in time, but the seeds will start to dehydrate. The pods, the shells or the husks or the pods themselves will begin to turn brown and you'll see that they start to shrink. And eventually the outer covering of the seed will become hard and eventually it'll become the seed coat. So when the seeds become dead ripe, uh, the pod or the husk or the shell, whatever surrounding that little embryo, that little seed, they will split open and the seeds will drop. And that's good. So then you know that the seeds are ready to be harvested. Okay. And you see this a lot with the native plants. But sometimes when you are in the dead ripe stage, the seeds may have already dropped. And so you go out one day and say, oh, I'm gonna go and collect those seeds tomorrow because I can just ready to do it. And you go out the next day and those seeds have already been dropped. And so keep an eye on your plants, make sure that you know what stage they're in if you're really interested in wanting to collect the seeds for that. Uh, for vegetables, uh, you wanna harvest the seeds when the fruit is fully ripe. Uh, remember that each plant is different, so you may to do, need to do your research. So when you're talking about vegetables, such as tomatoes going from green to red or green to yellow, whatever. On cucumbers, you're looking for a green color, maybe to a yellow color. That's going to show a maturity and the seeds are going to be riper at that point. From peppers, green to red or yellow, uh, those type of color changes on that. The eggplants, go from like a violet green into a white or golden yellow. Lettuce seeds, generally wait until the seeds are ready to fall out on their own. Um, and plants with pods, you wanted to be able to uh, know when it's completely dry and brittle. For grasses and forbs, for those native plants, the seeds are harvested at the milk or soft dough stages. And so you have the stages of maturity, it goes from milk to soft dough to medium dough, hard dough, and then mature. But what you want to do with these is to harvest them at the milk or the soft dose uh, stages, uh, usually shrivel and show poor germination. So these seeds, you don't want to wait or harvest at those points. The, the seeds that are harvested at the hard dose stage or mature stages uh, have the highest germination and greatest longevity and storage. So that's when you really want to do them. Most native plants do not hold seeds for long periods of time and they're susceptible to shattering. And that's where the pods open and they disperse the seeds all at once um, when they're ripe. So how can you tell? It's, sometimes it can be a little bit hard, but you can do a thumbnail test 
if you take the seed and you firm your thumbnail pressure on the seed itself and there's no damage or very little damage or indent in that seed coat itself, then that seed coat is hard enough. If you notice that when you push your thumbnail into the seed itself or the seed coat and it goes through into the cotyledon or the embryo wherever it's at inside the seed, then it's not ready to go. Let it stay out for a while. For plants where the seeds may start to ripen but don't ripen all at the same time, the best thing to do is to harvest the seed head when the seeds are at the milky stage or when the pods are just starting to turn color. Place on a newspaper or put them in a paper bag. Keep the bag, the top of the bag open to promote air circulation. But overall, for any type of seed maturity, you need to do your research for the type of plant that you're going to be working with. So let's talk a little bit about harvesting the dry seed head. So there's a difference between harvesting dry seeds and wet seeds. So we'll start with the dry ones first. General guidelines, collect the seed before 10 a.m. after the dew is gone. You don't wanna do it when it's damp. You wanna be able to reduce any type of disease or, or, or potentials that may be associated with it when you start collecting. So collect the seed before 10 a.m. You wanna collect from a healthy plant a plant that doesn't have any type of diseases, any insect eggs. So look at your plants closely before you start harvesting those seeds. You want to collect the fruits and vegetables when they're well ripe. Sometimes they may not ripen all at the same time. You may have a four to eight week difference between those, but try and collect them when they are well ripe. The general guideline is to harvest basically when you get about 60 to 80 percent of the seeds are ripe on that plant. So that's gonna give you a pretty good germination rate. So how can you tell what that is? So for most plants, you're gonna look at the color of the fruit and the seed or the pod, right? And so that's what we talked about a little bit earlier. You're gonna look at the dryness of the seed or the pod. For spinach or onion, you're gonna cut the seeds open See if the inside is starchy instead of milky. So that's another good way. And it's not just spinach or onion. You, know, you can do that on other plants as well. But most of the plants will have that hard seed coat. So you won't be able to really do that. But some of these, such as spinach and onion, you can go ahead and cut them. How easy is it for the uh, seed pod to be detached from the seed uh, stalk itself? If, it's, if it detaches easily or if it's brown or the seeds have opened like you see the picture on the right, then these are ready to go ahead and harvest. With peppers, you're gonna do it when the skin of the pepper is soft and so it may be past the stage where you wanna eat it, maybe be a little bit softer than what you would have for an eating pepper. If you're growing herbs, you can go ahead and cut them. You can turn them upside down, hang them in the shade one to two weeks if it's a dry season. If you have a, a wet season or a high humidity, you might want to do three or four weeks. When you cut these herbs, you may want to put some paper bags surrounding them. So when the seeds start to drop, they'll drop into the bags and keep them. Seed pods of the beans collect when the outside skin is dry and full of seed. And then what you're going to do with the carrots is that you're going to harvest the seed pod itself into a paper bag and then keep the seeds that drop. So you notice that you had the, the seeds, the seeds that were just starting here and then eventually it's going to go ahead and turn into brown and that's when they're ready to be harvested. Cleaning the dry seeds. So dry seeded crops you're going to harvest before all the seed is sufficiently dry and mature. You may need additional uh, curing time or time for them to ripen a little bit more before processing or trying to clean them. The seed must be dry and hard enough to withstand any processing and plant material must break away from the seed or the seed pod easily. You need to have an airflow. You need to be able to uh, uh, placing the seeds in a shallow container, hanging the plants or seed heads upside down. Those are really good ways of having good airflow associated with it. Next thing you want to do is try and remove the chafe from the seed. So there's several ways to be able to do that. You can go ahead and use a screen. The, depending on the size of the screen or the size of your seeds is how um, small or large those screen holes are going to be. Another way to do that is by winnowing. 
And <clears throat> you see that a lot where you pick up the seeds and you just let the wind blow them away. Uh, you lay them out on the ground and you just kind of throw them up in the air and the seeds will fall back down, but the chafe will blow away. Fans are another way of being able to do that, depending on the seeds that you're trying to save. And another way is a lot of commercial growers do it through machines themselves, but there are machines available. If you want to spend the time and the, and the money to be able to do that, then more power to you. But generally a homeowner, you don't need a machine. Hand doing is, is very well. It can be done very well. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the wet seeds. So wet seeds are generally found in tomatoes and eggplants, some squashes, cucumbers, melons. These are the nice juicy ones. Uh, you need to be able to wash and clean the seeds to separate the seed from the pulp itself. Okay. So let the wet seeded crop mature on the vine as long as possible before harvest. That's going to be the important thing with these wet seeds. For winter squash or that you have, it may be better to uh, let them sit in storage for an additional two to three months. The seed quality and the germination percentage of the seeds have a potential for being increased if you let it stay, uh, if you don't harvest it right away. Just let them sit for another two or three months. You can harvest the fruit prior to, to the maturation of the, all the seeds. If you have a problem with an insect, knowing that insects are going to be coming that may damage it, or you have weather that's coming in, like cold weather, and you don't want to keep them outside, you can go ahead and harvest the fruit prior to when they're mature and let them continue to ripen in storage before extracting them from the fruit itself. Wet seed processing, there's two different types. There's a soaking and then there's a fermenting. So let's talk about soaking first. Soaking makes the seed cleaning easier. It loosens that pulp. So on the top picture, you see the seeds with some of that pulp that's associated with it. That pulpy residue that clings to the seed is what you're trying to remove by soaking. So you're gonna place the seeds and the pulp in a container full of water you're going to allow the seeds to soak until the pulp can be removed. And this is anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. You don't want it to get warm, so keep it cool. Keep it in a, uh, outside of the sun, uh, cool area, until the hours are up. Now, this is going to vary depending on the species uh, or the varieties of plants that you're going to be working with. If you find that after 12, 13 hours, you see some seeds that are starting to sprout, then you know that it's time to rinse and dry them, okay? So you're gonna have to keep an eye on these because there is a potential for some of these to sprout while you're trying to do this processing. So uh, again, uh, it's gonna be important to uh, 12 to 24, no longer than 24, and then rinse and dry them. Vegetable fruits and uh, other than tomatoes and cucumbers work well with this type. The second one is called the ferment fermentation process. And this cleans the seeds the same as soaking, but it removes a germination inhibiting gel from the seeds and it can, can destroy some diseases. So if you think about the tomato seeds, when you cut them open, that gel that surrounds the seeds is a gel that stops germination. That's why you don't see those seeds germinating within the plant themselves, okay? So tomatoes and cucumbers are the ones that you want to use for fermenting in the process on this. Uh, any other crops, uh, you may damage them if you use a fermentation process. But basically what you're trying to do is to place the seeds in a littered jar and add water to it. Place the container in a warm location, 72 to 86. And it's this warmth that starts the fermentation process. Remember when I said you're doing a rinsing, you don't wanna get it warm because if it gets warm, then it's gonna to start to ferment. So this temperature increase is gonna make the big, big difference on that. This fermentation process can take anywhere from one and a half to five days, depending on the crop and the seed itself. If the seeds start to sprout, then the seeds have soaked too long and damage has occurred. So the best thing to do is don't let them sprout. You can do a, finger, a field test or a finger test, field test. If you are looking at your seeds 
and you think that they may start to sprout, you can do a field test. And this is when the seeds no longer feel slippery. Maybe they feel rough. So pick up some of those seeds from there and feel them. If it feels rough, that means the gel is gone. And the seeds sinking to the bottom and the pulp at the top of the jar is also a good indication that the fermentation process has occurred. Now the white mold that you see on the right, that may develop on the surface and you can get rid of that by stirring frequently to prevent the layering of mold and will encourage the fermentation process as well when you stir. And the fermentation is complete, then you're gonna go ahead and decant and rinse as well. The rinsing process is gonna be fairly similar. You're gonna remove the pulp from the seed in a colander or a strainer, place them in a large container, add one part seed and four parts of water, and then you're gonna go ahead and agitate. That's gonna help break off some of that gel that's surrounding the seeds. Wait a few minutes for the good seeds to sell on the bottom, pour off the bad seeds uh, and the debris and the pulp. And then you repeat this stuff about three to six times until you know that the seeds that you are, uh, that you are trying to save are gonna be fairly clean and ready to go. So drying the seeds themselves, you're gonna dry as quickly as possible to reduce the disease potentials. Uh, don't expose the seeds to temperatures greater than 95 degrees as this uh, could develop or damage the embryo. The seeds generally are going to be uh, thinned out in thin layers. You can use a screen or sheet pans, baking pans, nonstick surface. Remember that if your seeds are wet, don't use paper towels or newspaper or cardboard under them. Uh, the seeds will stick and become damaged. So I've done this a couple of times when I first started as I put paper towels on there, it's gonna absorb that water and then I put it in the oven for a while and I came, pulled them back out and my seeds were stuck to my paper towel. And every time I tried to paper, pull them off, those seeds were damaged. So don't use those. Uh, any type of metal, uh, sheet pans, hard pans, screens, screens will give you a good air circulation surrounding them as well as they dry. Other ways that you can dry seeds, you can use a silica gel, and there's a packet of uh, gel that you can purchase uh, commercially if you want. You can put it in an airtight container and that silica gel should absorb that moisture. It should remain for two to seven days, but the problem with this is, is that if that gel comes into contact with the seeds, then you probably shouldn't use the seeds. So be really careful if you're gonna use this way to do it. Uh, another way is using a food dehydrator. And so if you're using a food dehydrator, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's generally what I kept my oven at when I tried to dry my seeds. Uh, the time will vary based on the seeds themselves, but a food dehydrator generally works really well. And what you're looking for is a percent seed moisture. For small seeds that are ready for storage, you're looking for a three to 5% seed moisture. And the larger seeds, five to 7%. If you get below minimum percentages uh, and the seed may go uh, become damaged. So the, the concern is, is that making sure that you have enough moisture to keep that embryo alive, but, not a, uh, but doesn't drop to a point where there's nothing in there and the embryo dies. So your next question is, how do I determine this? Okay, so the test of percentage moisture is seed moisture percent equals the fresh seed weight minus the dry seed weight. Well, that's well and good, but I don't have a, a scale, right? So another way, there's a couple of other ways that you can do this. The first one is called the brittleness test. And this works well with thin seeds like squash seeds. And so when you get the seed and if you try and snap it, it, it should snap very easily when it's dry. The thicker seeds such as corns and beans, you hit it with a hammer. If it's dry, it will shatter like glass, okay? If not, and you hit it with the hammer, it's gonna mush, it's gonna smash, and there's just gonna tell you that there's too much moisture within that seed itself, okay? So that's one way, the brittleness test. The second way is through an envelope test. And the best thing to do is to place an envelope in a container with the seeds and leave that overnight, okay? Seal up the jar, whatever the container is, and then leave it overnight. And the next day you're gonna come back and you can compare the envelope from the container with an envelope that's not left with the seeds. If the container envelope seems damp, 
then the seeds are not dry enough to store in the container. So that envelope and that paper is going to absorb some of that moisture and, you, and that's another kind of easy way to tell. But again, it's going to be based on the percentages of how much moisture is going to be within that seed. Now, this is where the, the most problems that people have when they store seeds is that they put them in their jars and they seal them and they come back three months later because they want to use them in a soup and then all of a sudden they see that there's mold growing on the seeds, okay? And it's because that there was too much moisture within those seeds themselves. Uh, what I do and, and my, my past generations that have been taught to me is that when I put my seeds into a jar or if I do any dehydrating of plant like peppers or anything that I dehydrate and put in jars, I generally put a little bit of rice kernels in there. And so the rice kernels will help absorb some of that moisture as well. So there are several ways to be able to do this, but it's that moisture that's going to cause that mold. So if you see mold in storage, then take the seeds out, maybe try and dry them a little bit more and then put them back into storage. For seed storage, the uh, area should be uh, cool and dry. And the type of containers, there are a lot of suggestions out in the internet when you start looking at them. And so I just kind of listed them. We'll talk about them very briefly. Containers such as paper or cloth, that allows for moisture release. Remember, the seeds that you have spent all this time trying to dry are now at that perfect percentage that you want. If you put it in a container, where more moisture can be released or absorbed from the atmosphere, now you are changing that. You may result in death of the seeds or non-viability, or it may result in mold. Uh, so this doesn't generally protect against insect or rodents either. And if you are out in the country like I am and I store my seeds, sometimes these rodents can get into them before I have a chance to use them. So, not only are you looking for the moisture content, but as far as any predators that may come in. Plastic bags, it'll restrict the moisture release, but it's not protective against those insect or rodents. Plastic tubs, bins, or buckets, that may restrict your moisture release, uh, and it has somewhat of a protective against the insects and rodents, but if they really want it, they'll chew through that plastic container and they'll get to your seeds. Basically, what you're going to try and do is to use a glass jar or other type of container. Uh, this will help to restrict the moisture release from the seeds, and it can also protect against uh, insects and rodents. So overall, the less air contact the seed has during storage, the better off it's going to be. The changes in the seed's environment, such as the drastic temperature changes or changes in the moisture level, will decrease the viability of the seed itself. So make sure you try and keep it consistent. Storage temperatures, okay. Um, the temperature of the storage area plus the percent of relative humidity within that area, if you add those two together, it should not exceed 100. So that's kind of a general guideline right there. Uh, for a refrigerator storage, that can be used as a medium term storage uh, in an airtight container. You can keep them in the refrigerator. If you're going to use them, make sure that when you bring them out from the refrigerator that you let them get to room temperature before opening the container. Otherwise, you may have more moisture developing in there than you want. You can freeze your seeds. This is good for long term storage. The problem with freezing the seeds that you read in the internet is that they say that they're going to freeze. Yes, moist seeds will freeze. If there's too much moisture within the seeds, that moisture will turn to ice and it will kill that embryo. So you have to make sure that if you're going to freeze your seeds that they are at the proper moisture level before you do that. Seeds must be in an airtight container and it must be very dry. Again, if you're going to put them in the freezer, when you bring them back out, allow them to reach temperature, room temperature, before opening the container. And again, the longevity of the seeds is going to be dependent on the seed temperature and the humidity that it's going to be there. 
So for each 10% decrease in soil and seed moisture, the life of the seed is doubled. Likewise, the life of the seeds double for each 10 degree Fahrenheit drop in storage temperature. So that'll give you a little bit of a basis there. Many seeds stored at zero degrees Fahrenheit for considerable lengths of time can be done, providing that the moisture level is sufficient. Seeds dried properly, freezing temperatures will not endanger their viability. But on the other hand, freezing temperatures can kill any insects that have managed to hitchhike rides with the seeds. So that's gonna be a good thing as well. If you're saving your seeds, you may be able to freeze any type of pests that may have hooked onto your seeds before you put them into storage. Storage times, most vegetables three to five years, native plants two to 10 years, but you wanna do with those native plants is to plant them within the first year if possible. Short-lived seeds are generally one to two years. So again, you're gonna to have to do your research to determine where you're at with all of that. The labeling itself, you're gonna go ahead and put them into envelopes, some sort of paper envelopes, however is the best way to go ahead and label them. You want the plant, the variety name, the year that the seeds were last grown, maturity dates, and any other information that you want for you to remember what those seeds are and how they should be planted out. All right, so that covers a lot of it right there. Now. We didn't touch on a couple of things called seed dormancy and germination. So there are seeds that are out there that need to have some sort of seed dormancy met before they will be able to grow. So seed dormancy is defined as a state in which the viable seeds or seeds that are able to grow, they are prevented from germinating even when the environmental conditions are favorable for germination. So why does this occur? You know, you figure you throw them out there, they're gonna germinate. Well, not always. They generally, the seeds generally do this to overcome any type of environmental conditions that would otherwise kill the embryo, such as winter temperatures. Seeds also do this to create a seed bank and the plants develop these seeds to create a seed bank in the soil. So they know that within the next two, three, four, five years, I will still have seeds in the soil and everybody's familiar with the seed banks that are in the soils, right? So you plow it up, you get rid of it all, you plant your garden, you didn't have any weeds and then all of a sudden next year, boom, you got those weeds again. Well, that's, those are the seed banks, okay? So this seed dormancy is going, it, seeds used and the plants used in order to help them to survive. And there's different types of seed dormancy and we're going to talk about uh, three of them. First one is called physical. This is a physical dormancy. The hard seed coat is unable to take up water and this requires what we call scarification. And scarification is a seed treatment to make a hard seed coat more permeable to gases, water, or the emerging seedling. So let's take a look at this. The picture that you see on the right there is a seed. The, you can see where it has been filed down to that white. That white is where that embryo and the cotyledon and that, the, the food source for that little embryo is at. Opening the seed up, to the environment is going to help break that dormancy. Now, most seeds, when they do this, those hard seed coats, a year of overwintering in winter weather or, or being soaked for long periods of time or an acid soak, uh, generally does the same thing as scarification. But if you have seeds and you want to plant them and germinate right away, these hard seed coats may require you to do that. And the way I used to teach my students is that you take the seed and you rub it against the sidewalk. So that's the easy way to do it. Or take a hand file and file back and forth just on one corner of the seed until it breaks open and you know that water can get in there. The acid soaks are generally used for commercial production. Second one is physiological. These are internal signals that uh, in the seed that tells it not to germinate. And these type of uh, treatment requires stratification or chilling. So a chilling period is required. Temperatures 35 to 50 degrees for three to five months. Stratification is a moist chilling treatment. Uh, you want to be able to uh, use a moist 
soil, maybe a paper towel. You're going to put it, uh, wrap the seed in it or put the seeds in there in a Ziploc bag, enclose the bag, and then throw it in the refrigerator. That would be the best way to do it, okay? Before sowing your seeds, do your homework. Learn about any special requirements for germination. Some of the uh, native seeds like native milkweeds or bead balm, uh, they require at least one winter outside before they'll sprout. So maybe some time in the refrigerator will bring them back out. Other seeds, it may be that they just need a longer period. So you do your research on these things. The other problem with this type of stratification is that while it's in storage, because of the high moisture content within the baggie, this can encourage fungal growth. So commercial propagators generally treat the seeds with the fungicide prior to storage. So there are fungicides out on the market. If you have questions or concerns, feel free to email me after the webinar and we can talk about it. And other seeds such as the Southern Magnolia has a, have a double dormancy. So the red seed that you see at the bottom there, that red covering is a chemical that stops the germination process. And on top of that, they have a hard seed, scope, uh, seed coat that requires scarification and then that needs to have that cold temperature or stratification. And so both of these have to be met before dormancy occurs. Again, doing your research is gonna help you with that. When you talk about seed germination, very simple, easy, real quick. When the seed's ready to germinate, it's going to take in the water. It's going to change that endosperm or that food source from a starch to a sugar. It's gonna make that sugar available to the embryo to start production. Once it starts production, the radical or the root will emerge first to anchor it into the ground, and then the cotyledons will form, and those will emerge second outside of the seed coat. How do you test for germination? Well, an easy way to do it is to take a wet paper towel, put your seeds in there, roll it up, put it in a plastic bag in a warm area for two to three days. Once you open up the paper towel, you will see that some of these seeds have germinated. Okay, you'll see that radical starting to come out. You may also see that some seeds haven't. So if you put 100 seeds on a paper towel and 50% of them germinate and 50% didn't, that means you have a 50% germination rate. Okay, easy and simple way to do it. Okay, I know I'm a little late, but I wanna talk a little bit about native wildflowers. And we had some questions on that. So native wildflowers generally are grown in a fragile ecosystem out in nature. Okay, they support pollinators, they support birds and small animals, butterflies, and they're there to help support all of that. They're dependent on seeds for reseeding. They're dependent on nectar and pollen in order for those pollinators to come in and help them. But if you have people that come into areas where they start taking or destroying this habitat, you may lose the entire species of plants. These were pitcher plants that were taken from a natural area. And so all of them disappeared. So now there are no more there. So those pollinators that were looking for uh, the nectar uh, may not be able to survive or they'll have to go someplace else to find it. So removal from natural habitat is illegal. So that's just plain and simple. Digging, picking, or collecting of seed, that affects the long-term survival in that location. So it affects the pollinators and it affects uh, depend that depend on it. Most wildflowers, if you do take from nature, will not survive transplanting into your home garden. So basically, don't do it, okay? The legal way to do it is that the USDA Forest Service has some really good collection information. They also have a collection program. So if you want to learn or you really want some information on that, the USDA Forest Service has some really good stuff. The endangered plant federal rules and regulations can be found on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website which the uh, website is there, the link is down on the bottom. The one in the back, the USDA Forest Service, also gives you information as far as uh, rare plants. What are rare plants? What do you consider them? How do you care for them? What do you need to look at? So these are two great sources for that. The biggest question I get every time when I get to talk about uh, native plants is gonna be milkweed. So I just added a slide on this at all. The milkweed is important because it is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. Milkweeds are listed in some states and provinces as noxious weeds, but you know certain milkweed species are considered noxious because they can be poisonous to cattle and they can be uh, poisonous to other livestock. 
So in some locations, it's difficult to improve the habitat for monarch butterflies because of this status. Eradication of milkweed is a threat to the monarch butterfly. And there are additional threats to the monarch butterfly, such as the use of herbicides and pesticides. But with the milkweed, what you're looking for on these pods is that these pods develop, they're gonna turn green. Once the pods on the left uh, start to ripen, those seeds will open up and you'll see them. Those, that white puffy stuff will tell you that it's gonna be windblown. And so when these seeds are ready, they will require some sort of a chilling before you can plant them out. But that's what those pods are gonna look like when the seeds are ready to emerge. The adults always feed on the nectar of many of the flowers, but they breed only where milkweeds are found. So the larvae would not develop into a butterfly without the milkweed. And there's a lot of uh, habitat uh, monarch information out there, information on developing a habitat area for the monarchs. Uh, this is our uh, picture of a couple of our master gardeners in the Bond County area where they have a habitat area set up in their uh, community there. So there's a lot there for the monarch butterfly. Other information for this is on the USDA website, species beneficial to the monarch butterfly, and it will also list some of these in the database. So you just click on one of those uh, links and it will take you specifically to that plant to give you more information. A great uh, resource for that. Okay, the rest are gonna be resources for you that you can go ahead and write down or you can email me if you want and I can send them to you either way. First one is the University of Illinois Extension has a great wildflower uh, website that you can use. It gives talks about native plants, the habitats, how to obtain plants and other good information on that. Second one is from the Illinois, University of Illinois, and this is at the Cook County website. And I wanted to point that out because this is where you can really download it for your, for your own use. This is really nice. It not only talks about the Illinois native plants for the home landscape, it also talks about tips for successful plantings and how you can do that. But when you open it up on the inside, it's gonna give you information as to the type of plants or the, the name of the plant on the left. The pictures that you see there is going to show you what those plants look like in spring, summer, fall, and winter. So you get a better idea of what it's gonna look like in your garden area. It's gonna tell you what type of sunlight it needs, how high it gets, what type of soil, and what attraction does it have? Does it attract the butterflies, the bees, the hummingbirds? So a lot of this really good information, and the nice thing about this is it's in color. And so I like the color so I can see it a little bit better but that's a good one. The other one is the Native Plant Network. And this is a uh, reforestation nursery and genetic resource that uh, I have used in the past. Uh, the, the goal of this is they uh, give you information on growing and planting of North American native plants for people that wanna do restoration, conservation, or reforestation. So you go on this website and on the left-hand side, you see the propagation is circled. So you can click on the propagation link. It's gonna take you to the next level. Then this next level, you're gonna hit on the left-hand side, protocol database. And when you hit that, it's gonna go into a search database. So for this one, I chose uh, Echinacea, which is the purple cone flower. So I wanted to see what they would have on this. And when I went in, this gives me some really cool information. It tells me where it's from. This was University of Kentucky. They downloaded some research that they did into this site. And it also tells you the propagation goal. They want to develop plants. The propagation method was seeds. Okay, the propagation, propagule processing. The seeds exhibit physiological dormancy. We've talked about that. So you know what that means. Seeds are placed in cold stratification for 84 days. It's done for you. That's the timeline. Germination occurs at 20 days. Alternating temperature cycle. Germination was greater in the light than dark. All this information is to help you to find and, and get your native plants propagated and growing properly. Good resource. The other one is a tall grass prairie native seed production manual. Okay, that's from the University of Northern Iowa. Some really good information on there as well. Xerces Society has some information on pollinator friendly native plants. It gives you a list. The nice thing about this site is that it covers the fully United States. So I just put, picked Mr. Midwest region and put it up there, but that covers just Illinois since I'm talking in Illinois. But there are other 
uh, pamphlets and publications out there to cover throughout the United States. So no matter where you're at, this information is available for you. And some of the references that I used for this talk. And other than that, I am done. So do you have any questions that are coming up at all? Other than the questions that you had in the beginning, you know, you already answered those unless some people came in later. Okay. I've already addressed them during your presentation. Is it better to store seeds in plastic or glass jars was one that came earlier. Um, well, if anybody does have questions, go ahead and enter them in the chat box. I'll be around for a few minutes. There's one new message. Let's see. Um, can you put your resource page? I can't see what it says over there. Can you put your resource page back up? Can you go back up one? Okay. One. Is that what you need? Uh, it doesn't have all the seed. The, the, the websites that I just talked about are not in the resource pages. I can send that to you separately if you email me. So those websites that I just talked about, if you want me, I can send them to you. Just let me know. Right. Okay. Any other questions coming in? I apologize for the length, but there is a lot of information. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you. We got uh, Lori's uh, email over there. Just email her any questions or more information that you may need. Sounds thank good. you. Thank, thank you everyone, everyone for joining. Thank you, Lori. Yeah. I will be sending out an evaluation for this webinar. So fee, uh, feel free to uh, please answer it. And so we get a better indication of how we're doing and what you'd like to see from in future ones. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good day.